All right, engineers, so in this video, we're gonna talk about direct factor inhibitors, such as factors two inhibitors, so thrombin inhibitors, and we'll also talk about direct factor inhibitors of factor 10. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about these guys. So the big ones that I want you to remember, these direct factor inhibitors, there's two groups, right? So one of the big ones here is going to be your factor two inhibitors. So let's call these your factor two. And again, what do we call factor two? We call it thrombin. So let's remember, this is your direct factor two inhibitors or thrombin inhibitors. Now, with these guys, you have three specific types of drugs, okay? And we'll talk about when you use these as compared to when to use heparin, when to use warfarin. Again, these are medications that are becoming more commonly used and preferred, and we'll talk about why. But this is gonna consist of three particular drugs, okay? One is called Argotraban. Argotraban. The other one is called Bivalarudin. And the last one is called Dabigatran. These are the three most common ones. So what I want you guys to remember here with these, factor two inhibitors, right? Argotraban and Bivalarudin, these are good alternatives to patients who are taking heparin and maybe have some type of severe reaction to heparin. Maybe they have a really bad allergic reaction to heparin or they have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. This is another alternative because this can be given IV. So if you remember, unfractionated heparin in certain patients, uh, it can cause that heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And again, low molecular weight can as well. So you can give this medication as an alternative to that, argotraban and bivalirudin. The bigotran is in the PO form, okay? So this is a PO form. So you're gonna give this in an oral form. So that's something I want you to remember. Now, they're factor two inhibitors. What does that mean? That means that these drugs specifically work to do what? To inhibit thrombin. Now, thrombin is an amazing enzyme and it does so much. Let's look at what some of the things it does. If you guys remember from your coagulation cascade, and again, we're just pre-drawing everything up here because we've gone over the coagula coagulation cascade for antiplatelet medications. We've gone over in the hemostasis video, warfarin, heparin. So we're just gonna kind of fly through this really quick. You get a platelet plug, Negative charge surface from the platelets activates factor 12. Factor 12 then activates factor 11. Factor 11 then activates factor 9. Factor 9 and factor 8 will then be combined together, make a complex and activate factor 10. Factor 10 will then, with the com com combination of factor 5 and platelet factor 3, convert prothrombin into thrombin. Now, this drug directly inhibits thrombin. Why is that important? Because thrombin is needed in order to activate factor five, which helps in activating, pro th activating thrombin. It also activates factor eight, and factor eight is also important because it's involved with the combination of factor nine to be able to activate 10 and then thrombin. So that's an amazing mechanism here. What else? Thrombin also converts fibrinogen into fibrin, which helps to make the fibrin mesh, which helps to stabilize that secondary hemostasis process. On top of that, it activates factor 13, fibrin stabilizing factor, which cross-links this fibrin mesh and helps to be able to, again, stabilize that secondary uh, hemostatic plug. So if you can imagine, we inhibit thrombin, we inhibit a lot of these clot processes from forming, as well as reducing the progression of clot formation, okay? So that's an amazing thing about these medications. Another group of medications that are direct factor inhibitors are actually going to be your factor 10, okay, your factor 10 inhibitors. And these are pretty cool drugs, but they are a little bit more potent. They do have a higher bleeding risk. What are some of these drugs? And these are all given in the PO form, okay? These are good alternatives to warfarin. Now you're gonna notice something. In these names, they have factor 10A in them, right? They have XA in their name. Rivaroxaban. Look at that, look at that right there, XA. Apixaban. Look at that, XA. And another one which is called Adoxaban. Look at that, XA. 
right? So that's a good way to remember that your factor 10A inhibitors are gonna be rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban. And again, these are usually given all in the PO form, so oral. And again, how do they work? Well, if you guys look here, we're just gonna draw over here. We're gonna say here's these drugs, right? So here's going to be your factor 10A inhibitors. They work by inhibiting factor 10. If you inhibit the factor 10, what do you then do? You inhibit the inhibition of thrombin. Now, why is this more of a larger bleeding risk? Here's, what the, here's the reason why I want you to think about this. If you inhibit, so you have factor 10, right? Factor 10, when it's activated, can activate multiple thrombins. Okay, so if I activate multiple thrombins, and again, from that downstream effect, I'm gonna activate multiple fibrinogens and convert them into fibrin, I get a larger downstream cascade-like effect. So if I inhibit here at the level of the thrombins, like ergotraban, bivalirudin, dabigatran, I'm not gonna have as profound or of an amplified effect. If I inhibit higher up within the coagulation cascade, I'm gonna get a more amplified effect because that's just one factor 10. If I inhibit multiple factor 10s, I inhibit multiple upon multiple amounts of thrombin. So that's why they have a higher bleeding risk, okay? So that's our mechanism of action. Basic thing here for factor two inhibitors, ergotraban, bivalirudin, dabigatran, and factor 10A inhibitors, rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban. Big thing to remember, these medications are good when someone can't take warfarin or doesn't want to take warfarin. These are good drugs to give to patients whenever they can't take heparin or for whatever reason have some type of severe allergic reaction to heparin, okay? And again, we'll get into that, talk about that a little bit later um, in the video, okay? So this covers the mechanism of action. Let's go into the indications. All right, so the next thing we need to remember with these medications is they can also be used very, very similar to that of heparin, okay? Now, if someone can't take heparin, right, because they have that reaction, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, then what can we give them? We can give them factor 2A inhibitors. So if someone has an acute DVT or they have, so let's say they have an acute DVT or they have a PE, right, so pulmonary embolism, and these type of situations, we can give them these factor 2A inhibitors if they have a, some type of severe allergic reaction to heparin or they have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. But which ones do you give? You give the IV forms. So this is where we would give medications like argotraban or bivalirudin. Okay? If someone has an acute pulmonary embolism, again, we would give argotraban or bivalirudin, okay? Now, prophylactically, okay, prophylactically, if someone does actually get like some type of surgery, they have a hypercoagulable condition, they have a malignancy, anything that makes them more likely to form clots because they just had surgery, they're bedridden, they're not mobile, anything like that, you're trying to prophylactically pre prevent them from developing an acute DVT or acute PE, you can give other types of medications. So let's write that down. So if we're trying to do prophylaxis um, for DVT and PE, then we can give a bunch of other different medications. So then we can give other medications such as dabigatran, which is the oral form, right? We can also give the factor 10A inhibitors, which are gonna be what? You can give rivaroxaban, you can give apixaban, you can give adoxaban, okay? Because so, these are gonna be your oral medications. And again, they're gonna be good for prophylaxis, long-term types of effect. Okay, so this would be kind of similar to the warfarin-like effect or the bigotran, like the low molecular weight heparin effect, right? So that's important to remember. So QDVT, you're mainly going to be giving, which one are these? I want to make sure I write these down here. Argotraban, bivalirudin, these are your factor 2A inhibitors. And again, same thing here, factor 2A inhibitors. These are good for acute DVT, acute PE indications when someone cannot take heparin, and that should make sense. Okay. Let me actually write that down. 
can't take heparin. And again, the reason why is maybe they have a severe allergic reaction to it or they have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, okay? Next thing, we can give it to patients with atrial fibrillation. But I gotta be specific, guys. Again, we talked about this a little bit with heparin. You can only give this to patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation, okay? In other words, they don't have any mitral valve disease. So they don't have mitral stenosis. They don't have rheum uh, rheumatic fever that causes um, you know, inflammation and then mitral stenosis via that process. They don't have senile cardiac valve fibrosis, nothing like that. Their condition is they have some other disease. Maybe they have a catecholamine uh, condition. Maybe they're uh, taking too much methamphetamines. Maybe they're hyperthyroid. Maybe they're hypoxic because of some type of lung disease. They have electrolyte abnormalities. That's altering the atrial uh, circuitry in some way, but it's not affecting the valve. In those situations for non-valvular AFib, when someone can form, again, these clots. Why? Why can they form these clots on the valves? because of the stasis of blood flow. Remember, whenever the atria are having these ectopic foci, they're firing all different areas and they're having these quivering contractions, which are not powerful and aren't able to push enough blood from the atria down to the ventricles. So, if I'm going to give somebody, right, a medication for non-valvular AFib, Right? And let's say that they are allergic, they have heparin induced thrombocytopenia, they have a history of it. Non-valvular AFib, and we, uh, we, they're, they're coming in and they're having an AFib with RVR. We try to rate control them, okay? Again, it goes back to this. First thing you do, let's say that they come in, they have AFib with RVR, and you rate control them, and it doesn't work, okay? To no avail. Then you do rhythm control. And what do you need for that? You have to cardiovert them. And that requires shocking them. If you're going to do that, what do you usually give? You have to do a transesophageal echocardiogram to make sure that there's no thrombus within, inside of the atria. Then you can shock them, okay? And you're gonna anticoagulate them with heparin. What if they're allergic to heparin or they have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia? What medications do you give? This is where you'll give medications like Argotraban, by Valerudin, okay? Now, this is when you'll give it acutely, right? So you'll try to give this basically, if they do have a thromboembolism, right, you can anticoagulate them with this. There is other medications though, again, what other medications could we give if we really don't want to acutely do this, right? So we're gonna be able to treat them with other medications like PO versions. So you can give them also Rivaroxaban, a pixaban, and even a doxaban, right? So someone has non-valvular AFib, they come into the ER, you try to rate control them, and that doesn't work, you gotta do a rhythm control, you gotta cardiovert them. Again, what are the big things that you gotta watch out for? Do a transesophageal echo, make sure they don't have a thrombus. If they don't have a thrombus, you can shock them. After you shock them, you gotta anticoagulate them, okay? Because their pumping function of the atria is going to improve, and therefore you can pop a thrombus off or they're more likely to even form a thrombus still. So you have to anticoagulate them. If they can't take heparin, you can give them argotraban and bivalirudin, right? But at the same time, you also can anticoagulate them with rivaroxaban and apixaban. But again, you gotta remember, this is non-valvular AFib. If it's valvular, you give them warfarin, okay? Another thing to remember, rivaroxaban and apixaban are somewhat contraindicated in giving patients who have a prosthetic valve. If they have a mechanical heart valve, you don't want to give them rivaroxaban and apixaban. So here's something I want to mention. If someone does have a heart valve, okay, so if you have what's called a prosthetic valve, no bueno on the factor 10 inhibitors. Do not give factor 10 inhibitors. They're somewhat contraindicated in that sense, okay? They did studies where they found that it still increased the thrombogenic potential even giving these medications. So, giving patients argotraban, bivalirudin, rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban, all of these things are options for patients with non-valvular AFib. 
If you protect them from breaking that thrombus off and forming an embolus, what do you protect them from? What's the most dangerous thing that you protect them from? A clot going to the actual circulation of the brain. What's that going to cause? If that breaks off, you can cause a CVA. What if you form a clot within this circulation, the renal circulation? You can get a renal infarct, right? That's not good. We don't want that. What if you get one within the splenic circulation? You can get a splenic infarct. What if you get one that actually forms within the vessels going to the superior mesenteric artery, inferior mesenteric arteries? You can get some type of mesenteric ischemia, or you can get a ischemic colitis if this breaks off. What if you get an acute arterial embolus that goes to the leg? This could lead to limb gangrene, right? So that's another important thing to think about. You're protecting these patients from so many different potential complications. Another thing is you can, they don't, um, it's not always used, but again, if someone does have an allergy or they have heparin-induced thrombocytopenia to heparin and someone is having like an end STEMI or a STEMI and they can't take heparin, again, you can give argotraban and bivalirudin. Okay, because again, those are going to be the main IV forms that you can give them in this situation. All right, so ADRs, it's so simple. We've done this like so many times, guys, so you guys should know. You give an anticoagulant like this to patients, they're at risk for bleeding. Again, it's a simple thing. You're thinning their blood, you're trying to prevent clot formation, or at least prevent the progression of a clot formation. So because of that, what are some of the things that you have to watch out for when you put patients on these medications? Bleeding. Bleeding from different sources. If it's bleeding from the gingiva, okay, so gingival bleeding. This is going to be burned into your brains forever. If they're bleeding from the nasal cavity, anterior epistaxis, all right. If they're bleeding from the actual rectum, so if they're having rectal bleeding, this could be, uh, if it's bright red blood, it could be hematochesia, all right. If it's dark blood, it could be melena. If they're bleeding through the oral cavity, in other words, they're having hematemesis, they're vomiting up blood, okay? Or if there's no visible blood present, but they have iron deficiency anemia. Again, what do you want to do whenever somebody has iron deficiency anemia and they're showing signs of that? Obviously, if you want to check a CBC and also to do a fecal occult blood test, make sure that they're not having any type of unseen GI bleed. If they're bleeding out um, of their pee pee hole, obviously you want to watch out for hematuria. If they're bleeding from excessive vaginal bleeding or menstrual bleeding, you want to watch out for that as well. And if you see that they're having lots of bleeding on the skin, maybe they have like little punctate bleeding signs, right? So maybe they're having signs of uh, three different types here. Maybe they're having petechiae, which are small little hemorrhagic marks. Maybe they're having larger lesions like papyric lesions or maybe they're having big kind of like bruising like ecchymosis. These are things that you wanna watch out for. If you're giving somebody these medications, you, you wanna know, do, is there a possible antidote? Well, for some of them there is, and the big one that you wanna remember is dabigatran, okay? So dabigatran is one of the main ones that has a proven antidote Okay, it's a monoclonal antibody. Okay, so this is a monoclonal antibody that you can give if someone is receiving too much dabigatran. Okay, you can treat them with a monoclonal antibody called Ida Rukizumab. Okay, it's a monoclonal antibody and it's basically going to bind on to dabigatran and create dabigatran inactive. So, therefore, it's not able to inhibit any more factor two or thrombin. So again, too much dabigatran, the treatment for that is going to be idabrachizumab. That's your antidote. So remember, this is the antidote. The other thing that you want to remember is some of the factor 10A inhibitors. So if you have some of the factor 10A inhibitors, if you have too much of these, again, which ones are these? This is a pixaban, a, uh, a doxaban, rivaroxaban. There is a drug that they found to be helpful in preventing this and trying to reverse it. It's called andexanet alpha. And it's not actually with a pH, I know. It seems weird. But andexanet alpha is somewhat believed to be an antidote for those who have received too much 
factor 10a. Now that leaves us leaving the question, okay, we, we covered rivaroxaban, we covered apixaban, we covered adoxaban, we covered dibigatran. Oh, well, what about bivalarudin and what about argotraban? What do we do for those? There really isn't an antidote. So really the only main thing that you can do for these patients is you can try to replace some of the clotting factors. So if we give too much bivalarudin or we give too much argotraban, and we're in big trouble here, then what can we give as an antidote? Well, really the only thing that we can do here is we can try to replace the clotting factors that we're actually inhibiting. In this case, we can give what's called PCC, the prothrombin complex concentrate. If you guys remember, this is consisting of mainly four factors, which is factor two, which is thrombin, factor seven, factor nine, and factor 10, and again, we also put in protein C and S, and we also throw in antithrombin three, just to have somewhat of a um, you know, opposing effect in this situation. So prothrombin complex concentrate is the thing that we'll give to these patients, hoping that that'll possibly reverse the severe bleeding, okay? So again, things to watch out for whenever you're giving these medications. One other thing that you gotta remember, you have to remember when giving these medications, you cannot just suddenly stop them. If you stop the medication suddenly, it increases the risk of forming clots, okay? So that's something to remember. Do not discontinue these medications suddenly. There's an increased risk of clots. All right, so the last thing that you guys gotta remember here for these medications is obviously there's a bleeding risk. So if someone's already like bleeding, uncontrollable bleeding, right? So maybe they have uncontrollable bleeding, <laughs> this is not gonna be a medication that you want them to be on, okay? They might have to stop this medication for whatever reason. If a patient had a recent um, ischemic, I wanna make sure I put that down, ischemic CVA. Because if you give them some type of anticoagulant, they have an ischemic CVA, you give them that medication, you have the chance of actually converting it um, into a hemorrhagic transformation. So that's something else you wanna watch out for. Um, another thing is, again, watch out for patients who have extremely high uncontrollable blood pressure, especially if they're, they have some type of increased predisposition. Maybe they're a smoker, they have an increased risk of aortic dissection. Maybe they're older, their walls are a little bit more thinner, they have an increased risk of an aortic aneurysm. Okay, these are all things that you have to take into consideration when you're giving this to, to patients. Last thing that I wanna mention, besides the bleeding risks is, again, for me, it's really important that you guys understand when do we give these medications, why do we give these medications. So to go back to these again, because I want us to really understand why, um, factor 2A inhibitors, right? Inhibitors. And if you guys remember, this is your bivalarudin. This is argotraban. When do we give these medications? What is their indication? And again, you can also remember that there is dibigatran, okay, which is the oral form. But what is the indication for these? These are basically used when patients can't take heparin. Maybe because they have a severe allergic reaction or more commonly they have this reaction, the heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. This is a good alternative, especially the bivalarudin and the argotraban, okay? The other thing, and again, another, another super indication is maybe they also have renal failure, and if they have renal failure, or they also have the risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, you might also go with these medications as well. The other thing is to remember is the factor 10A inhibitors. These are becoming more commonly utilized instead of warfarin. Again, this I want you to remember is the PO forms, and this is rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban. And the main reason these are being used is they're used when um, in, in, in place of warfarin. Now, let's explain why maybe someone might want to use this medication instead of warfarin. Three main reasons that I want you to remember. There is obviously a bunch, but there's three main reasons I want you guys to remember. 
One of the big things is that Warfarin has tons of drug interactions. Remember that video where we talked about the O devices and CP bars? Tons, and that wasn't even all of them. That list is not, there's so many more, but those were the more common ones. So tons and tons and tons of drug interactions, okay, for Warfarin. Another reason, you have to constantly be monitoring the efficacy of warfarin, making sure that you're, don't, you're not bleeding too much, making sure that you're not at risk of clotting. So because of that, you have to constantly monitor PT and INR, so constantly. And that can be a pain in the butt. That can be something that patients don't want. That's not really, uh, gonna, that, that can actually affect compliance, so someone continually taking their medication. The last thing that I want you to remember is that warfarin takes a while, okay, so it does take a long time to kick in. Whereas with these medications, River Roxaban, Apixaban, Adoxaban, they have a pretty you know, quick onset. So if you're comparing these medications, sometimes patients might want to go on River Roxaban, Apixaban, Adoxaban for those indications that we talked about, right, but not valvular AFib, if maybe they're more willing to say less drug interactions less interactions with also food that they're eating. They don't have to monitor their PT, INR constantly, and it doesn't take a long time to kick in. And there's also less side effects. So because of that, rivaroxaban, apixaban, adoxaban seem like a more uh, important, like a better thing to utilize. But the problem with these, and one of the things that kind of turns patients away from it, is the cost. Okay, they are pretty costly. So that's something I just wanted to mention because I think it's important to know when do we give these medications instead of the other medications. It helps us to be better clinicians, okay? So that covers everything that we need to know about the factor 10 and factor 2A inhibitors. All right, engineers, so in this video we covered your factor 2A inhibitors, your factor 10A inhibitors. I hope it made sense. I hope you guys really did enjoy this video. If it did make sense, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and subscribe. Please do it. Also, if you guys get a chance, go down in the description box. We have links to our Facebook, our Instagram. Leave some messages. We'll try to get back to you guys and communicate with you guys. Also, we have a links to our Patreon account if you guys want to go there. Donate any money. We would truly appreciate it. It helps us to continue to make videos for you guys' enjoyment. But as always, Ninja Nerds, we love you, and until next time.